so uh, my previous video on the transition rates ended up with something that we call the Fermi's golden rule right and we said that it is applicable to a lot of or a variety of interactions and so one of such interaction is the electric dipole interaction that we are going to look in this video right so uh, a vital application of the time dependent perturbation theory is to understand or study the interaction between an atom and the electromagnetic field and uh, this kind of a problem will eventually lead us or tell us on how the laser and atoms interact right moreover it will also aid us in understanding the lifetime of the excited states so for how much time these states are going to be in that excited state right or the electron is going to be in the excited state right so to begin with first let me point this out that I'm going to neglect the interaction of the atom with the magnetic field component of the electromagnetic field and I can do this because uh, that this interaction with the magnetic field is actually really small small by a factor of a uh, fine structure constant right S so let me start with the Hamiltonian right so the electric dipole time dependent Hamiltonian which I'll write down over here is h1 as a function of t is equal to negative d and d over here is the electric dipole moment dot the electric field right and this electric field will now be time varying electric field right so this is the Hamiltonian of my electric dipole the time dependent Hamiltonian and so let's define our electric field as uh, say your electric field as a function of time let's define it as 2 times epsilon naught and uh, epsilon hat right so that's the unit vector uh, times the cosine of omega t and so now it is a time dependent electric field right so we added this 2 over here uh, just to because we are going to now write our cosine term uh, in the exponential form right so then the 2 cancels out and we're left with the rest of the expression right so and this e hat is or epsilon epsilon hat is just that the electric field is in uh, that particular direction right okay so uh, now as I said I'm going to write my cosine in terms of exponentials so when I do that then I'll have my electric field as the two will go away right uh, and then I'll be left with epsilon naught this thing or actually let me just write it down over here uh, I'll bring that uh, because we know that cosine in terms of exponential is open in two terms right and so let's write it over here as epsilon hat and I'll have my epsilon naught exponential of my iota omega t times exponential negative iota omega t right and we would have a 2 underneath as well but we had a 2 on upstairs this one right and so that 2 cancelled out okay so now if you look at this expression for the electric field recall that this has a same form of the time dependence as in the generic harmonic perturbation that we did in the previous video right 
and so uh, therefore we can use everything that we did from the previous video over here right and uh, well uh, the polarization of this electric field is determined by the unit vector epsilon naught right so let's just get that out of the way okay so now also note that we shall ignore the spatial variation of the field and why can we do that that's simply because of the fact that the size of the atom right that is approximately so I'll write the size of the atom by s atom right is approximately um, it's approximately 0 0.1 nanometers right and uh, if you look at the wavelength of the visible light so let me write that with lambda right so of visible light is approximately equal to I think 500 nanometers right okay so let me repeat the statement again that I can ignore the spatial variation of the field because of the fact that the size of the atom is extremely or much much smaller than the wavelength of my visible light right and so what this basically means now for the atom is that at any given instant right it will see the same electric field so what that means is that the electric field is no longer time dependent right because the atom is just going to see the same electric field at whatever time it is right so therefore the cosine omega t term shall drop out right and uh, so this is now an approximation right so we can give this approximation a name and let's call it uh, the dipole approximation right so this is my dipole approximation okay so let's move on to the next page and let's see that we can now drop the time dependence term right and then we can identify or say that our perturbation is now actually this thing over here that is negative d dot my polarization direction times my electric field e naught right the magnitude of the electric field all right so this thing over here is now actually my perturbation right okay so we also know what the electric dipole moment is mathematically and that is simply at my electric dipole moment is written as d vector is equal to negative e that is the electric charge times my r the position vector right and with this perturbation right uh, may now be written as this thing over here we can write it down now as v is equal to my e the negative sign goes away epsilon naught the polarization direction dot r the position vector right okay so now what I want you to do is recall from the previous lecture right that we defined our Fermi's uh, golden rule right to uh, get the transition rate and what was that right so first let me actually box this thing over here and let's recall that the transition rate from going state i to state f initial state to a final state that is defined as 2 pi over h bar squared and the matrix element this thing over here modulus squared which is actually uh, the probability right and the delta function omega fi minus omega 
Right. So now we shall use this transition rate. Um, yeah. We will use this uh, Fermi's golden rule to obtain the transition rate, right? And so now in place of this uh, V over here, right, let me substitute this uh, perturbation V. And so let's go ahead and do that, right? So when I substitute the perturbation, what I get my transition rate equation as is as such 2 pi over h bar squared f e epsilon naught epsilon dot r right so this is unit vector and r position vector and I have my i modulus squared right and then not to forget my Dirac delta function that is omega fi minus omega all right now if you look at this over here uh, my e and epsilon naught are actually constant or you can see that or you can say that uh, the only the r term in our matrix element depends on the atomic states that are i and f right and so we can take out all of the rest outside and so we'll have our transition rate equation something like this right 2 pi e squared right because not to forget that we have this squared over here right so e squared epsilon squared epsilon naught sorry yeah and uh, over h bar squared and then we'll have this position vector dot my f I, I'm sorry I called this epsilon position vector it's actually the polarization direction right and I have r over here and my i over here right and then modulus squared and then again my Dirac delta function omega fi minus omega alright okay so from now from here on we sh uh, this thing over here actually is what we wanted right and it is the uh, transition rate happening right in the uh, for the electric dipole interaction and so now this result right it has this Dirac delta function in it so let's actually go ahead and discuss this result now right so we know that uh, the delta function is actually not something physical right and so to see how this transition rate is applied to a practical situation or a real situation well, think of well uh, two situations right so one of them one of the situation is that the perturbing field is not a single frequency right and it's not coherent and in such a case then we'll have to sum over the transition rates that are caused by the spread of the frequencies right because it's not a single frequency anymore so there will be a spread of frequencies and so we'll have to sum over all those such transition rates right now the other situation is uh, something like that we have uh, quantum states that are uh, continuously distributed right or the quantum states are continuous and in uh, such a case then we'll have to sum over the transition rates to a spread of energy states right and so both of these cases now they have their own importance right so they're equally important and we use uh, the first case right uh, when a broad band light source excites a discrete atomic transition right and so what that is is it's like this thing over here so let me actually draw this graph for it right uh, I don't know if I should call it a graph actually a transition diagram I guess and so say that this is my initial state and this is my final state right 
And so for the broadband excitation, I'll have uh, something like this, right? Let me get this thing over here. Yeah. Okay. So I'll have this. Okay. And then this thing over here. Okay. So these are actually straight lines, right? And uh, it will look something like this, right? And so these are my discrete atomic transitions, right? Okay, so and we also uh, have for the second case and that is actually used when we use a monochromatic laser to excite a system to a spread of excited states or sometimes even a single excited state, right? And so um, this thing over here actually is for broadband excited states, right? So broadband excited states, right? Okay, and so for this uh, monochromatic, right? Monochromatic uh, laser, so uh, for that we'll have this transition thing look like this one second yeah okay so these are my two states right and this is my again initial state this is my final state and so what we'll have now is let me just draw it first right okay and uh, Yeah, so this is the spread. Let me just highlight it, right? Okay, so what this is showing you is that a monochromatic laser is used to excite a system to a spread of excited states, right? So this is the spread, right? Okay, so this transition diagram over here is for my monochromatic laser okay right 